Um, and we very much want to answer your questions, but we're going to do that at the end of the session. So if you think of something while we're speaking and uh, you want to make sure you don't forget it, you can put it in the chat and our colleague Kristen, who's moderating, um, can scoop that up for us and ask the question at the end of the session. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Hopefully. Before we begin, Gabriella, it looks like oh. we have somebody who, who has a question whose hand's been raised for a while. So um, Leslie, I'm going to allow you to talk and please ask your question. <laughs> Hi, Leslie, can you hear us? Yes. Do you, Do have, you have a, a question? question? Say it again. Do you Did have you a question? Have a question? Do I have a what? A question. No, I do not. Okay. Thank we you. We thought you did. Uh-uh. No. Okay, great. So then we'll start. Okay. All righty. So again, to reiterate, Calvin is our online library catalog. It's accessible from our collections page, which is what you're looking at right now. Um, it's also accessible directly via catalog.history.pcusa.org. It's here on our collections page alongside Shepherd, which is another online catalog that we're going to be taking a closer look at in a future session. I'm going to spend a little bit of time today explaining the difference between Calvin and Shepherd and which resources will be described in which of these databases. But I want to emphasize in general that if you're doing research, you should check both of these tools. So what is in Calvin? As the phrase online library catalog suggests, most of what, or a majority of what is in Calvin, 68%, are publications or records for publications. So that's this big blue piece of the pie. These are books, pamphlets, and periodicals, and they are items that support our mission to document and share the history of American Presbyterianism. So they range from rare books published before 1800 to important theological works, 19th century religious tracts, collections of hymns and psalms, sermon books, church histories, reference books, biographies of important Presbyterians, mission histories, and scholarly books on contemporary issues like Christianity and racial justice, women in the church, and LGBTQIA concerns. And of course, also the perennial question, why you can't take 20 dogs on a date. So Calvin also includes, in addition to publications, descriptions of archival materials of a few different types the first are what we call the processed record groups, and these are collections that have had the most um, thoroughgoing treatment by an archivist. So somebody has gone through them, rehoused materials, maybe reorganized things, and then created what we call a collection guide, which is a very detailed um, description of the collection, what you can expect to find in it. There's a biography of the creator and a detailed inventory. So items. Um, that have been treated as the record groups get a collection guide, and then we create a sort of briefer version of that collection guide and put it in Calvin. Um, and you can tell you're dealing with a record group because in the call number section, you're gonna see this RG indication. So these can be the records of national church agencies, important Presbyterians like this one, this is a personal paper collection. They're also the records of ecumenical organizations um, and Presbyterian missions. Then another uh, kind of archival material described in Calvin are the small personal paper collections, which as their name suggests, are much smaller. And so they don't get that full collection guide treatment. We just create a short record for them in Calvin. And you'll know that you're looking at one of these because it'll have SPP for small personal papers in the call number. And again, you can see just visually, this is a much briefer record than the one we just looked at. And then finally, we also use Calvin to provide access to congregation, presbytery, and synod records that were received at PHS before January 2017. After January 2017, um, we, described, we started describing 
Congregation Presbyterian Synod Records in Shepherd, which was a, a new database to us at the time. So there's kind of this demarcation um, and similar Congregation Presbyterian Synod Records may be in one or the other um, database, depending on when we got them. So this is another reminder, especially if you're interested in archival materials, that it is always good practice to look in Calvin and Shepherd both. So besides publications and archives, um, the remainder of what is in Calvin kind of amounts to a lot of stuff in non-print formats. So we have sound recordings on a variety of, me on a variety of media, and these include um, interviews and oral histories, maybe a musical performance by a choir. Uh, we have motion picture or moving image materials on different formats, and these range from kind of amateur video recordings to actual films produced by the church. Um, we have graphics, which are two-dimensional kind of flat visual items like certificates or blueprints. We have slide sets, maps, kits, which are these um, church produced <laughs> sets of materials. It'll be like a film or a film strip and then some reading material that goes along with it. So there are these little like packaged kits on a particular topic that were distributed by the church. And finally, we also have objects. Um, they did not make it onto my pie chart by mistake, um, but these is, the objects described in Calvin are communion wear, and then um, we have a collection of like commemorative church plates, so you will find records for those in Calvin as well. So knowing what's in Calvin is kind of as important as knowing what is not in Calvin. Um, before 1980, the society cataloged everything on three by five index cards and put them in this card catalog. So there's a portion of our collection for which we haven't yet moved the records into an electronic database. And those things you can only find records for in the card catalog that you see pictured here. So, you know, in non-COVID days, you can come into the society and search the card catalog yourself, but we can certainly um, do some searching for you if you get in touch with a reference archivist. So pre-1980 catalog materials may not be in Calvin. And then of course, everything that is described in Shepherd is not in Calvin. And again, this amounts to um, small personal papers, church Presbyterian synod records received after January 2017. Also, any archival material that has like just walked in the building, we create a brief description for and put that record in Shepherd, not in Calvin. So any unprocessed archival material will be found in Shepherd. And then there's these um, vertical file collections. These are like little, uh, they're folders of ephemeral material, like photographs and clippings and kind of smaller non-book length items about uh, foreign missionary personnel, important Presbyterians or congregations. Those items are only described in Shepherd. And then our museum and communion tokens collections are only described in Shepherd not in Calvin. So this is a kind of, it gets a little confusing. So on the Calvin homepage, we have included this description of what is where in an effort to help you understand. So if all of this flies out of your head tomorrow. We tried to write it down for you here on the Calvin homepage. And then I also made you this really <laughs> kind of lame flow chart which asks you, are you only interested in books or periodicals? If the answer is yes, you should only check Calvin. But if you are interested in books, periodicals, and really any other kind of material, you should check Calvin and Shepherd. So it's a, it's a pretty rudimentary little flow chart there. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about simple searching in Calvin. Um, if when you get to the Calvin homepage, which again is cataloghistory.pcusa.org, you're going to get dropped into this basic search screen. You can put a single term or multiple terms in here and search, and the system is going to find all the records that match your terms, but um, not in the particular order in which you enter them. So say I was interested in a search, or I was interested in materials about um, 
women missionaries to India. So if I do India missionaries, or just missions, women, and run my search, I would get 61 results. And you can see that uh, the system is highlighting my search terms where they appear. Sometimes you can't see the highlights. It doesn't, you can't figure out what's being highlighted until you click into the full record. So if I clicked on Sarah Bardwell Richards papers, uh-oh. I lost my preloaded search results. Okay, well, I'm gonna click in here and hope it doesn't take too long to load. Okay, good. So again, you can see your search terms are highlighted here and they're not um, in the order I put them in or stuck together as a phrase. So if you want to search something as a phrase in Calvin, you should use this keyword as a phrase dropdown as opposed to um, quotation marks. Quotation marks, I think we're used to from a lot of other systems, but they won't do anything for you in Calvin. Um, in addition to this kind of keyword only search, from the home page. You can also say that you want to search within particular fields in the record. Title and subject tend to be really kind of high value fields in terms of having words that indicate what a work is actually about. So those are good places to look. Um, subjects can be a little tricky because you have to use the Library of Congress subject headings vocabulary and sometimes that can be a little bit opaque. So we're gonna show you how to work around that in a bit. All right, let's see where I wanna be. Um, some other things to keep in mind when searching Calvin are that uh, spelling counts. So unlike Google, which has that nice, did you mean feature, you have to get it right in Calvin. It's not that smart. If you are particularly interested in using Calvin to find church records, I want to point you to this awesome resource that Charlene made in the past. It's a little video tutorial for searching Calvin for church records that you can play right from the Calvin homepage. It's also on our YouTube channel, if you're subscribed to that. <laughs> um, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about church record searching because you need, you know, this video will tell you pretty much everything you need to know. It's really helpful. So in general, when doing a search, you always want to start broad and then narrow your search from there to have the best chances of success. Um, so let's say I was interested in learning about women who served as missionaries. That was kind of my broad topic. So if I typed in, uh, say I'm having a weird day where I decided to use the word lady instead of female or women because that's just the word that pops into my head and I run this search I'm gonna get only three results which seems pretty low considering that we have a lot of mission material but lady missionaries in foreign lands sounds like it's on the money so I'm gonna click into this guy to get the full record and here I just want to pause for a minute to show you the parts of a record that you see in Calvin. So you get the title and then the authorship statement and then an indexed version of that author's name. So you see it's a little different. Um, publication information, a physical description, and then some subject headings. And then at the bottom of the record, you can see what kind of item it is. Um, and then it's call number which is what we use to retrieve it for you. And then everything is gonna say not for loans, so don't be alarmed about that. It just means that our collection doesn't circulate outside of the building. Um, and in fact, some of our microfilms are available for lending through interlibrary loans, so you would see that arc there. Uh, any of these hyperlinked fields can be clicked on, and then that's gonna run a search against the system using that value. So I could find everything Emma Raymond Pittman wrote but in this case, remember I searched for lady missionaries and I can see why my search was not very successful and that's because the subject heading is actually women missionaries. So at this point I could copy this or write it down by hand um, and then go to the advanced search page and use the correct subject heading to do a more complex search. 
Or if I wanted to search for women missionaries, I can click right here. And once I've run that search, see it ran up here. I now have 247 results, which seems more like it. Um, and now I have a pretty big result set that I might want to sort. So I can use this area in the upper right hand corner and sort my search results by a number of um, criteria. I can also limit the search by this criteria, any of these um, parameters on the left here. So I could limit by author, um, geographic place, a geographic place, all places are geographic. What I mean is geographic subject, topical subject, um, title subject. So these are books that are about other books in part, or in this case, a newspaper. And then uh, the little number next to the refining facet will tell you how many results you're going to retrieve if you use that facet to limit your search. So of these, um, there are very helpful, but I want to kind of draw your attention to two of them that can be a little bit tricky, uh, item type and collection. So these two things kind of describe the physical format of an item and or where it's located in our building. Um, and that's partly because we keep like items together in the building. Um, so you might be tempted to click on item type but sometimes these categories are a little misleading. So for instance, um, many of our microfilm holdings are actually archives that years ago were photographed and put onto microfilm. And so if you were interested in only archival materials and you clicked archives, you would be missing out on archival records that are captured like on a microfilm reel. So we would just caution you to use item type um, judiciously, carefully only if you are certain you just want a particular physical car carrier you know for your items and collections kind of have the same issue because they are also based on physical format and um, location in the building there are some collections that we hold that are what we call provenance collections which means that everything um, in the collection came from the same um, institutional or personal source or donor and because people tend to collect things on a particular subject matter these provenance collections often have a strong kind of thematic element to them so limiting your search in those can be useful if those uh, subject interests line up with your own so i'm just going to hop over to the advanced search page to show you all of the collections we have in calvin so this is the advanced search page charlene's going to spend a little more time here um, but you have these tabs and I'm going to go to the collection tab and you can see we have like a bajillion collections and a lot of them are format based. You see cassettes, discs, microfiche, etc. Um, the ones I've highlighted are I think interesting provenance collections that again just wanted to make you aware of. So the Foreign Mission Library was a collection created by the National Church to educate missionaries before they went out into the mission field. So there's um, like, you know, kind of standard Presbyterian or Christian works translated into languages from the mission field. There's uh, like kind of uh, books about how to deal with the locals or adapt to local customs when you go out into the mission field. And so it's just a very interesting collection if you are doing work on the Presbyterian mission enterprise or, you know, uh, questions of colonialism um, and kind of Christian imperialism. The Pothig collection is a collection that was donated to us by Richard and Eunice Pothig, who were Presbyterian missionaries with very strong um, interests in labor and urban and industrial missions. So if your interests line up with those, the Pothig collection will be useful to you. And then finally, John Knox Press and Westminster Press were the two publishing arms of the Northern and Southern Church. And then after reunion, they merged and became Westminster John Knox Press. So if you were interested in understanding, kind of maybe historicizing how the Presbyterian Church in America had presented itself to the world through its publishing history, um, I would encourage you to check out these, the John Knox Press and the Westminster Press collection. 
Westminster Press is the uh, source of you can't take 20 dogs on a date. So there's, there's definitely some interesting material in there um, once you get to the 20th century. Okay, I am now going to turn it over to Charlene. Okay, thanks Gabriella for all that information. Um, I'm going to take just a second here to share my screen. So you should be seeing the Calvin landing page again, and I hope everybody can hear me okay, great. So um, Gabriella did mention that when you land on this page, it will be a simple search box that you see, but you do have um, the option of performing advanced searches. Um, this option could be helpful if you've tried various keyword searches and you're, you feel like you're really ready to narrow your search. Um, more, more specifically. So here is the um, page for the advanced searching. Um, you can see here the different fields, how you can combine them and select specific types of material if that's also of interest to you. So you could combine a search for say um, subject, and you could combine that with a particular author. And you would enter some terms in here, click the search button and get some results. You could do um, keyword and author. You could do author and title. Um, there's an option here for um, publisher. Um, Gabriella mentioned Westminster John Knox Press. If you knew that you know there was a particular publisher that you were interested in, you could use that field to search on title and subject if you were looking for um, materials about um, you know the China mission but you knew that the word China was in the title you could select title and then some other parameters here to narrow your search even more hope you get the idea with all the options there um, you could select specific types of materials. As Gabriella mentioned, um, there are these tabs down here. Um, you can click any of these formats, as many as you want. If you were just interested in films, you could click the film strip um, tab here and it would just search on materials that are formatted as film strip. If you leave them unchecked, Calvin will search across all of them. Um, but again, just the caveat that Gabriella mentioned before, um, sometimes doing an advanced search can be more limiting and you may just be better off doing some other simple searches and refining your results from there. But I do wanna show an example of an advanced search. So um, let's say you were researching the Presbyterian response to the civil rights movement and you're specifically interested in material relating to the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. So to do a search like that for a really specific um, material, I'm going to use the subject phrase. I'm going to type in the words civil rights because I want to capture those two words in that order. I'm not going to use quotation marks. Um, and then I'm going to also search the keyword Birmingham. So when I do a search for that, I'll get two results. We have a lot more material about the civil rights movement, but again, this is a really specific search. So it's gonna bring up two results and I'm going to click on this first heading, the meaning of the Birmingham tragedy, just to show you the full record. This is what the full record looks like. And now I just want to draw your attention to the note that's highlighted here, online resources. 
We use the field online resources to share content that's available on other parts of our website or on other external websites. Um, we link to the online resources as a way to increase access to the collection and also to help tie together our various catalogs and databases. In this case, the online resource is actually a digitized version of that motion picture. And we link out to Perl, our digital repository. So this is what it looks like in Perl. And you can actually view the video. Um, if you're curious about Perl, um, we did a session about that a few weeks ago, and that recording is available on our website. And hopefully Kristen will share the link with you to that um, Perl recording. Other types of online resources we link to are collection guides. These are the finding aids for processed record groups, such as this one for the Jack Haper papers. Clicking on this link for collection guide will bring you to the finding aid, which is on a different part of our website. Um, but the finding aid includes more detailed information about the papers, and it also includes um, the box and folder listing and the collection inventory here. That's how we link together different parts of our website. This record here is for a book titled In the Ojibwe Country. Um, it contains links to digitized versions of this book that are available freely online um, from a couple different sources. And to give you an example of, you know, if you click on this link for the Internet Archive copy, this is what you will see. You can actually page through and read this book on the Internet Archive. Um, these types of resources for Internet Archive and Google Books tend to be you know, material before the 1920s. Um, if you're wondering why a book that was published a few years ago is not available, that's why. So you may have noticed um, some icons that are prominent in, in Calvin. Um, one of them is the cart. So you can see there's a note here, add to your cart on the right hand side. You um, may have noticed on the top, there's this little icon with an actual shopping cart. You're probably asking, what is the cart? Um, the cart is a temporary holding place for you to save specific catalog records that you're interested in. Um, it is something that is only saved for the one web browsing session that you're doing. So once you close your web browser, the cart will clear. Um, it's not permanent. It's just a quick way to save records and maybe print out a list of what you found. If you're planning on doing more in-depth research over the long term, we would definitely recommend creating an account in Calvin. Um, you can do this by either going to the landing page. Um, somehow it disappeared, but <laughs> Uh, there used to be a link that says register for an account here. Um, or if you just um, go to the upper right hand section of your screen, there is information about your account here. So you can register here if you don't have an account. It'll ask you for an email address and a password and you can save lists if you have an account. You may have also seen these icons for lists. Lists are helpful if you're doing several different searches for different keywords or different topics. Um, you want to sort of compile all of your relevant results across your different searches into one or more lists. It's a good way to organize your research if you're doing really complex research. If you were um, looking at a brief list of results from a search. I'm logged in now, just by the way. Um, if you're looking at the brief list, one way to save to the cart or a list is simply to, you know, if this description sounds interesting to you, you can click add to cart or you can click save to lists. Um, you can add it to an existing list or you can create a new list, a new private list. Another way to do it is to 
scroll through the results, check off the ones that sound interesting to you. And then up here, it says with selected titles, add to. You can add to your cart temporarily, or you can add to a list. You can either add to an existing list or a new list. Those are two quick ways to save some of the results that you want to go back to. Uh, if you're not logged in, I'm, again, I'm logged in now, but if you're not logged in, all you will see here is add to cart. You can always get back to your lists by logging in and your lists are up here on the top part of the screen. These are some public lists that we've put together over time um, through Calvin, but here is where you will see your lists. So these are all lists that I've created in the past um, for various things. So that's how you can get back to your lists. Once you have a list, you can print it. There's a printing icon right here above your list. You can remove items from the list if you decide they're not relevant anymore. Um, you can send your list by email to a colleague, um, to a different email address, to one of us um, at the reference department. Um, that's a, a good way just to, and again, you have to be logged in to, to send your list by email, but you can do that with a little comment if you'd like. Okay, then um, another feature that's helpful if you have an account and you're logged in is the search history. So again, the cart is temporary. It will close with the browsing session. Same thing with the search history. If you're not logged in, when you close your web browser, your search history will disappear. But if you are logged in, you can click on your name when you're logged in, and then you can view your search history. So that would be helpful if, say, you know, two months ago, you knew that you found something really relevant to your research, and now you can't find it. So you could go back in time and pull up previous searches that you've done, and then um, if you just click on any of your previous searches, it will reload that search. So that's a really handy tool. Now, just looking at a full record in Calvin, just to point out a couple other features before we wrap up. Um, in any full record, on the right-hand side, you'll see this list of options here. These are just other ways to use Calvin. You can print the single catalog record. Here you can save it to your list. You can add or remove items to your cart through this um, part of the screen. This feature here called More Searches. It's a quick way to check other federated catalogs like WorldCat, um, just to see holdings all over the world of a particular item. Um, if you're not near Philadelphia, but you want to see if maybe there's another library that has a book, um, this would be a quick way to check WorldCat for a title. And if you're inclined, you could also share a catalog record through social media. I'm not sure if anyone's done that before, but um, it's possible. So that wraps up our tour of Calvin. Um, if you enjoyed this presentation, you'll be happy to hear that we're planning a similar tour of Shepherd in a couple months. Um, Shepherd, as Gabriella said, is just home to several of our other databases. Um, if you have questions anytime about searching the catalogs or databases or our website, we invite you to contact us. You can either go to our website here to submit a reference inquiry, or you can email us. Um, Kristen will share our email address in the chat, but it's refdesk at history.pcusa.org. In closing, we would just like to say that we are very grateful for our many donors and supporters who make programs like this one possible. If you would like to make a gift to PHS, please visit our website. Here's our giving page, or you can click on the link in your chat box that Kristen will be sharing. So from all of us at PHS, thank you. And we can take some questions now.
So if you're unsure, um, I think the best thing, if you have a question right now, is you can put it in the chat, uh, possibly also the q and I'm not entirely clear on what the difference is, but we'll check both. So, but we can't, um, we can't hear or see you, unfortunately, so. Hi, sorry, my, my computer froze for a minute. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we had a question from Maureen. Let me go back and check. Mm -hmm. um, she was wondering if the minutes online are still in the old paper catalogs, or are they the same as those in the paper catalogs? Yeah, Did, Maureen, maybe you can clarify if you meant um, GA minutes or like a particular congregation's minutes. I'm kind of thinking you might mean general assembly minutes, but not totally sure. Um, in the meantime, Charles was wondering what percentage of the PHS holdings have been digitized? <laughs> I think we got this question on Pearl Day as well. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's a very small percentage. Yeah. Very, very small percentage. It's very, it's labor intensive to digitize materials because not only are you scanning them and having to do that in a careful ways that you preserve the original item um, but then so we have two people who do that and then two people who also same two people but still um, create all the metadata around the digital objects so that you can use it because a picture is not helpful without you know all the you know you need to know what's in the picture and when it was created and um, do some subject analysis on it so um, there's a lot that goes into digitizing And uh, Cheryl, a, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say a follow-up question um, from Charles about um, PHS being able to receive records that are already digitized. And we do collect um, records that are in electronic formats. Um, you know, we have some guidelines about records that we would consider of permanent value or not. Um, you know, when it's possible, I think we do, you know, prefer paper copies in many ways, they are more stable in the long term um, in a lot of ways, but the short answer is yes, uh, we can um, bring in digitized materials, but not any digitized materials. We do have some, some guidelines. It looked like Maureen uh, followed up her question. Mm -hmm. She mentioned that you referenced um, some records that are all, only in the old card catalog. Um, and she was wondering if that included congregational minutes. I mean, Charlene, I think Charlene does reference, she'll know this better. My, my maybe incorrect understanding was that we've gotten all of the co congregational records out of the card catalog. Um, so not everything that was cataloged before 1980 is in there. Like we've gone and picked up things that we know are, um, kind of the most important to our users, and that includes church records. So those have all been shifted into the electronic catalog. Is that right, Charlene? I believe so, yeah, that official church records, session minutes registers that were only cataloged in the card catalog. I believe those have all been moved over to Calvin yeah. at this point, yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit like more, um, yeah, just, I want to say lesser materials, but not, not as kind of mission critical materials that are still in there. Uh, Cheryl had a follow up question. She was wondering if um, there's very little pre 1980 material in Calvin. There's a substantial amount of pre 1980, like materials published or created before 1980 there's quite a number of them in Calvin. So the 1980 date refers to when it was received in-house, not when it was created. Virginia was wondering, um, do you need to know the page of a book to request a copy of the book? 
or will someone look up the index to see what I'm looking for? Um, it's kind of a tricky question. Um, generally, in for our, our reference work, um, we like to say that we'll kind of check the catalogs and let you know what we have, um, but we generally don't have the staffing available to check specific books for everybody who asks. Um, that's not to say that we haven't done that before in certain cases. Um, you know, we are the archives of the Presbyterian Church USA. So, um, you know, if we're trying, if we're working closely with a congregation or a presbytery and they ask for some copies from a book, obviously um, we're going to um, do that work for them. Um, but, you know, we can't always do that for everyone. Um, we do have a digitization service Again, we wouldn't do it on every type of material, but there are some materials that, you know, rather than just making photocopies of a resource that one person would use in their research, we would properly scan it, add metadata to it, and make it available in Perl so that it's available to the larger research community. Um, so again, it kind of depends on exactly what information is being asked about, exactly what the resource is, exactly how busy we are at the moment with lots of other questions. Um, you can always ask if you know that you want a particular chapter from a book. Just email us and we'll let you know if we can or cannot cannot provide that. Uh, Barbara was wondering who uh, should be contacted about digitizing materials or accessing digitized materials. I think to start with um, the ref desk at history.pcusa.org email, that's kind of a general email address. Um, you know, there are several people on staff who can answer certain types of questions. So um, the reference department kind of is a good centralized place to have um, you know, initial inquiries come in. And then if, if it needs to be passed on to the appropriate person on staff, we'll do that for you. So I would recommend emailing the ref desk. We have a question from Facebook. Let me see. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel Joy from Facebook was wondering if periodicals were indexed and mm -hmm. can they search for a minister, a name of a minister? Some periodicals are indexed, many are not. Um, we do have, that being said, we do have a lot of biographical resources here about specific Presbyterian ministers or missionaries. So sometimes our own, we have a, we have our own, we call it a Presbyterian biographical index. That's kind of an in-house created thing. It's a card catalog and that's an index to other well-known periodicals. So sometimes we can check our, our own in-house index and it will say Reverend Thompson is mentioned on page 320 of this volume of this periodical. <laughs> um, somebody painstakingly took the time to go yeah. through and make that index. That does not happen today. Um, we, we are not um, maintaining that index. And um, again, a lot of the periodicals the actual physically bound periodicals in our holdings. A lot of them don't have indexes, um, but sometimes they do. But when they do, they're like often, they're not electronic. They're at the back of the periodical or the front. Um, and we are not a library that has uh, subscriptions. There are um, databases that index periodicals like JSTOR or, um, I mean, there's just like panoplies of um, kind of abstracting and indexing databases of journals um, like that you would access through a university library. Um, we don't have those kinds of subscriptions, but sometimes you might be able to find kind of indexes to journals that way as well. That's a good point. Like if you were trying to find out, uh, like you couldn't search Calvin for a minister's name and 
have an index like that come up in Calvin, you could search the minister's name in Calvin. And if he authored a sermon or if we had his personal papers, um, you would get results in Calvin for those types of materials, but not, yeah, not an index to a periodical. Yeah. And we would also suggest you go to Shepherd and search the biographical vertical file index if you haven't already, because um, there may be something there. And you would just get an indication, yes, we have a file on this minister. You won't be able to see the contents of the file. It's just an index. Uh, we have a question from Charles Davidson. He was wondering if PHS has workspace available for researchers visiting for a week or more. We have, um, we have to have our reading room, basically. We don't have any individual carols or special rooms like that for researchers, but um, we do have our reading room that has four tables in it right now, but at the moment, unfortunately, we are not open to the public for research. Um, at some point, we do hope to reopen for research, um, but with the pandemic right now, um, we're just kind of trying to keep everybody safely at home as much as possible, so. We have another question from Charles. He was wondering um, if PHS ever loans materials for use at the Presbyterian Heritage Foundation. I think, yeah, we've um, loaned materials for exhibits before. If there's a particular item you're interested in, um, you know, I would say, again, contact us at that reference desk email. Tell us a little bit about the material, um, you know, you're interested in. If it's for an exhibit or something, we would loan it. Um, if you're talking more about like an interlibrary loan, at the moment we do not participate in interlibrary loan of special collections materials, um, you know, for, for patrons to use, with the exception of select microfilm that we've created in house and like church records. We've microfilmed a lot of church records in the past. So if we have a positive and a negative copy of that microfilm, we could loan a positive copy of that film to another library. Um, we charge a small fee for it. Um, and those records in Calvin where normally it would say not for loan, you'll see a note that says um, available for loan, contact the reference desk or something like that. We, that's, that's the kind of loaning we do is interlibrary loan of microphone. Does anybody else have any questions? I don't see any others um, outstanding. I think that's it. Okay. Thank you guys. Thanks everyone.